one you do with the plugin, like it's all WordPress. So one you do with the plugin and the other one you buy a theme, you know? So like I went with a the theme part, you know? So it's going to be easier just to install the theme and you, you can stop playing with it, you know? Oh, it's, yeah, I'll have to look into that too, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fairly easy, Alex. If you have a um, if you have a developer, they can look at the back end of Bradley's site okay. and see how it's built. That's what my team did. They're working on my directory as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then I got a somebody to go a VA from the Philippines, and she scraped CDs from a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand. You know, so then to start, so I can start sending emails. So I have all those phone numbers and stuff. Oh, yeah. Emails and names, emails and address stuff like that. Name of the company, all that. Raphael, take an action. Sweet. Congratulations. Anyone, anyone else? Anybody else? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not working my inbox anymore. Um, I have a personal assistant uh, that I that I that I've converted over, um, and also even booked. A surprise trip for my fiance for her birthday. I didn't do it. I just told him what to do. So I'm freeing up time now so I can start focusing on the sales side of things. And I see Alec over there laughing, but bro, I'm telling you, man, when you can just send the audio message and then poof, be done and move on with your life, less stresses, because I can truly tell you, like when I was actually down in Florida, because I was so rushed. I actually booked a trip from Miami to Tampa for like a week after I needed it. I showed up at the airport thinking I had a flight. It was a mess. And I was like, I'm never booking my own flights again because I'm an idiot, number one. But <laughs> I just, I was busy, right? And I'm like too, trying to do too many things and I screwed it up and cost me money. So um, yeah, we're live, in the, we're live in the group, Jeff. Yep. Is that a direct result of you reading the Buy Back in Time book and kind of following those principles? Yeah. So I, I finished it up here a few weeks ago on my trip back to the East Coast. Um, immediately uh, talked to my American employee that I have, um, said, hey, can I can I buy a book and pay you to read it? And he said, dude, you don't have to pay me to read it. I drop shipped it from Amazon to his house. He read it over the weekend. He had a vision now of like what what I'm expecting within the company. He set up my inbox exactly how Dan talks about it um, and uh, started working that. Um, I'm now slowly going through my tasks, um, getting rid of them. And then eventually what he's going to do is buy back his time, making a list of things that he wants to continue doing and things that he doesn't. Like, I mean, let's just be real. He's reviewing my content that comes back, even though it's Chad GPT these days and he hates it. Um, I don't, I think that's a special person that, 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 <laughs> That really enjoys reading content for our website. Right. So we're eventually going to be replacing that position um, and creating, you know, whatever that position looks like well, off the task that he doesn't want to do anymore. That's awesome. That's a great way to set it up. If you have somebody that's already in that kind of mindset and willing to take action on it, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and like he, like one of the things I know for sure that he's sticking to is all the graphics uh, and all the, win the, the pr proof posts that we do on Facebook. I know that some members of the group have talked about like, hey, dude, I love your graphics. I've heard it from outside the group. And I'm like, what is this person talking about? And they're like, on Facebook, man, the stuff that you're, I was like, oh, that's not me, man. That's that's my assistant, Drew, taking care of that. And they're like, oh, he's really good at it. He loves doing it. You can obviously tell through his passion. So he's going to continue to do that type of stuff. That's sweet. Yeah. yeah. One of the things with sort of outsourcing, like planning and trips and things like that, I was in Dan Sullivan's strategic coach years ago. And one of the things that he does this is kind of aspirational when you start playing at this level, he's got plenty of money, but he has like an ABC setup where it's like, he'll tell his assistant, we want an A date tonight. So an A date might be uh, a casual place with a regular driver and a casual restaurant and then do something casual and B and then C is like super fancy. So They'll be like, okay, I want a C date or whatever, you know, whatever structure it is. And then it's like, okay, you show up with a limo and you go to one of these three restaurants or five restaurants that they pick that they have on the list of places they want to go. And then they just show up, he and his wife, Babs, they just show up and the limo drives up and picks them up, like that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's a pretty cool setup. Um, you know, one of these days we'll get there, right? 
well, even before I, before we read by back the time when I was, when we were down there hanging out in Miami, you know, hanging out with our mutual friend, Monik, uh, I think you were in the back seat. Remember he, he was like, uh, his, his Tesla needed to get into the shop. So he just hit up his assistant and was like, Hey, can you schedule service for the Tesla? Yeah. And then he's in, on to enjoying his life with us. We were going to the beach to hang out. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. you guys get in that mindset of the crap that you don't want to do and like, um, truly pay, you know, 25 to $30 an hour for somebody to take care of these problems and figure out what your time is worth. You're going to really see the benefits. Yeah. He definitely has a higher buyback rate than I do, but true that man true that we'll, we'll get there bro we'll get there yeah right all right you guys well today spencer and i were kind of thinking through what we could present that might be of value to you and for me it's like i see spencer's journey and lead gen is like coming into the model had a lot of business acumen and experience to begin with and somewhat in the marketing world as well but he came in and he got started, got off the ground like many of us, and then kind of got stuck at a certain number. And all of a sudden, he just exploded. And you guys have heard that story before about the specific tactics and strategies that he put into place. But when we were talking about it, he's like, you know, all that stuff doesn't really make a difference as much as the mindset shift that I've had over the past few years and working in this model. And just um, that was really the key to unlocking the potential of what he could create and what he's still creating. So he and I talk, you know, often and talk about mindset and everything. So Spencer has just been a really supportive member of this Lead Snap community. And uh, Patrick and I, the software, we've broken bread many times, San Diego, Miami, et cetera, and just have built a bigger and bigger relationship over the past year or so and have mutual friends that we're hanging out with now and all of that. So this is just another example of how, you know, getting to uh, different masterminds or events and getting in the rooms with people and seeing them over and over again and, and starting to really create um, synergy of where you can support each other in the model. I think that we've been a huge support to his growth and he's been a huge support to us. So Welcome, Spencer. I look forward to talking to you about mindset and hope to hopefully conveying and relaying some of those key points over to the audience today so that they can get the benefit of moving forward in their own businesses. Yeah, right on, man. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to kind of be super surface level with some of this stuff and then just have uh, Jeff dive in deeper and, and hopefully we'll have some time for some questions here towards the end because I don't want to run over our hour allotment. But yeah. Uh, I think we, when we talked yesterday, Spencer, we kind of started off with like the beginning, right? I think that yeah. a lot of our mindset comes from our childhood and the experiences that we have with our parents, with the sure. that we in, we're in, how we are um, resource. You know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, it's like safety and security before you even get into a space where you can have food and shelter and water and all of these basic things. It's like, those are the things we're dealing with as children. And when we don't have those things, it imprints these fears and scarcity mindsets into our subconscious. And we find that as we become adults, we play those things out as patterns in real time. So uh, what did that look like for you? Like, where did you start? How did you, what was the foundation of your mindset? I guess is a good question. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, as, as everybody has heard, you are a product of your environment. Um, and they're, you know, the neuroscience that I've been studying, uh, there's there's a lot of talk between the ages of five to eight as a child. Uh, a lot of your programming comes from that. Um, I grew up in a traumatic household, uh, alcoholic, abusive father, um, verbally abusive, physically abusive, you know, stuff that that children should have to see. Um, and that was through that period of time that that ages, you know, my parents are divorced by seven. So, um, you know, growing up in that environment, um, I was not focusing, uh, you know, as a child, you're, you should be focusing on the, on being a, on a kid, not, not like crap is my dad drunk and is he, is he going to whoop the shit out of us tonight type of attitude. So when you, when you grow up in that, I think you, you're, you're forced to grow up quicker and you're also not forced to have, um, the skill set of this mindset piece. Um, also, you know, like growing up in a household of, uh, I always like to say, um, you know, 
I don't want emotionally intelligent people, um, people that had a very poor mindset as well as poor financially. Um, so the product that I became um, was because of that. Um, I also grew up in a house of, you know, people constantly saying things like, um, <clears throat> you know, must be nice when they'd see people that had money or, you know, money doesn't grow on trees or there's more to life than money. Um, all those like coined things that you like we've all heard as children. Um, and, and, I, and I see a lot of people are commenting that it's the same situation. A lot of times people, you know, they, a lot of you can relate to this. So as I as I kind of grew, um, you know, I had teachers telling you, uh, you, you can be anything you want to be. But unfortunately, I never saw anybody be what they wanted to be. I saw parents that worked the same job. Um, for the majority of their life, uh, not making a lot of money, um, not being happy, um, all those things that we as in this community of, of, of agency owners can actually accomplish. Um, you are, you know, uh, you, you become what you actually see. And so with that being said, um, I, I, I watched a mom that didn't make a lot of money um, and, uh, you know, worked until age 65 and then actually um, you know, only lived another uh, four more years after retirement. Um, so with that all being said, um, back in uh, early, uh, the early pandemic, um, I had read David Goggins' uh, Can't Hurt Me. If any of you guys haven't heard, uh, uh, read that book and also listened to the audio version of it, um, pardon my French, it's fucking life-changing. Um, I read it three times um and listen to it one thing that i i picked up within this journey for those i know you guys have heard patrick talk about this but every book that i read i pay for the audio version as well and i read it and listen to it at the same time that is a, a tip from dr andrew huberman which is a, a, a neuroscientist that's a professor at stanford um and uh the name of the book johnny is that what you're looking for give me a head nod um can't hurt me david goggins it's his first book um, and, uh, so I read that something that stuck, stuck out to me, Jeff, in that book was nobody is coming to save you. Repeat that in your head. If you've had trauma, nobody is coming to save you. It is your fucking job to fix this. Right. Exactly. So with that being said, uh, Jen, my fiance gets sick with COVID. Um, you know, nobody knew anything about COVID. Uh, it was like month three, we're in lockdown. She's like 80% bedridden. She's extremely sick. She she still struggles today uh, with long COVID for those that are familiar with it. But I was forced into a situation of um, replacing her six-figure income as well as everything else, the cooking, the cleaning. I still own my insurance agency that I'd owned for a decade at the time as well as uh, my marketing agency. So um, it's kind of funny how things work. Uh, 75 hard had been a thing that I'd heard about pr prior to the pandemic. Um, and for those that aren't familiar with 75 hard, a lot of times people think it's like a, a, a physical thing, um, because there is some physical activity to it. It's not like a weight loss thing. It's a mental toughness thing. Majority of us cannot do anything for longer than 14 to 21 days. That is why you see these diet plans that are talking about lose 10 pounds in 21 days or whatever the case is, because they know us as humans can't commit to shit. So at 75 days of doing this, um, what I had learned was there was something about these morning walks that I did. I didn't know anything about it until like a couple years down the road, which I still do these morning walks every day, pretty much rain or shine. Um, I get out. Um, and I, somebody sent me a clip from Andrew Huberman, which, you know, I had, I had known of, but I didn't, I didn't know the, the science behind the morning walks. So I, I, I kept the morning walks in my routine. Um, at that same time when Jen got sick, um, I don't know if you guys have ever been in such an anxious, um, stage, but you know, I've grown in, grown up in fight or flight my whole life. And I see people raising their hand, nodding their head. Yes. Fight or flight is not the place that we all want to be. Right. But a lot of us are very used to that feeling. Um, so Jen gets sick and I literally it's June of 2020. 
And the only way I can describe it is I felt like I was fucking drowning. I had a call with my therapist and I was like, dude, I don't know what to do. I feel like I cannot come up for air. Like I am just, I just, it's so heavy. Like I was like doggy paddling on top of the water. And uh, he goes, well, like I, I talked with him for like 30 minutes and he goes, well, what are you doing for yourself? And I was like, bro, did you not hear me? Like the first 30 set of 30 minutes of our call? Like, I don't fucking have time. And he was like, I think you need to figure out something or, or this isn't going to end well. And um, so he suggested Forest Fridays to me. And, and as, as some of you guys know that follow me, uh, it's probably one of the weirdest fucking things you've probably ever seen or heard of. I know it's super weird. And when my therapist suggested go out to the forest, I know Alec and I talked about this in Florida and uh, go out to the forest, throw up a hammock and just hang out. And I was like, wait a minute, like what and, and do what? And he was like, nothing, bro, doing nothing. And I was like, you're meaning to tell me you want me to go out to the woods, put up a hammock and lay there for hours and do nothing. And he's like, yeah, exactly. For every one of us that is an entrepreneur in this room, you guys are probably thinking to yourself, I don't have time for that shit. Are you kidding me? I got all these different things going on. I got to worry about the, 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 the laundry and those emails and cooking dinner and the house and this and the kids. So um, at the time, I was only doing like less than 10K a month. Um, and I was like, you know what? What's the what's the investment? He was like, it's a few hundred bucks. I was like, okay, well, that's I, I can I can do that. I can tell you guys the first time that I did this, and I gave myself permission when I was out there of like when that thought comes into your head, racing in like, oh, dude, you got to respond to Chuck's email or whatever it is that's coming in because we're all getting blasted like left and right with all these thoughts. And I was able to just go, not right now, not right now. I give you permission to like not not think about this. And so for over over three years now, almost 90% of Fridays and 90% of every morning, I walk and I'm in a I'm in the forest and in a hammock. Rain or shine, I'm up in the Pacific Northwest. And anybody that lives like knows anything about Portland and Seattle, it rains a lot here. But I have rain gear. I go out there every week. Um, and well, the is it's super beautiful up there. And I think that's the point is being around that kind of nature and beauty, the trees and everything. It just gives you a whole new perspective on life. I mean, there's so much wrapped into what you just talked about, you know, with my own journey, I had to start making that time for myself too. I've talked about that on, on one of my mindset videos that I put out. And it's like that paradigm shift where you're like, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm inundated with stuff. Like, how am I going to take time for myself? But when I started taking time to do yoga every morning, it's like a two hour round trip going down there, doing the class, you know, coming back, getting back into my work mode and all of that. But when I made that commitment to myself, I dedicated and made that shift. It was life changing because I, I became centered and grounded I didn't wake up and start in this reactive mode where it's like, oh my God, somebody sent me an email. Somebody's pissed off at me and they didn't get this. And they didn't get that. What am I supposed to do? And who needs what? It's like, what do I need first? You know, yeah. I need to come into a grounded space where when I do step into the shit storm, it's not, at, it's not affecting me as much. I'm not as reactive, right? Because the shit storm's coming, right? It's always there. But if you ground yourself first, then it has less impact on your mindset and you know your entire outlook on everything that you're doing so man just like taking that time and my mentor challenged me to do it for 21 days to do yoga for 21 days and i did and i came back and had coffee with him after 21 days i was like how, why do people not do this like how, why wouldn't i do this every single day like, i have to do this every single day now yeah and and, and i think uh to, to to speak on on that i think in, in general, we feel very, at least I did before I started doing this, uh, very, um, it's like selfish about taking care of myself, if that yeah. even makes sense. Yeah. And as, as men, I think, I think men experience that a little bit more than females, just because of the societal pressures that we put on ourselves about like, 
you know, providing for the house and being the man of the house and making the money and, and taking care of all the, you know, all the, all the stuff, because society says we have to do that. Majority of time, we're not doing the things that we need to be doing as, as, as humans to be selfish, like that hour walk in the morning, that's my time. Like right. you ain't taking that from me anymore. You know what I mean? Like I don't schedule appointments. Nope. Like that is my time. That time in the woods at noon on Friday, my alarm goes off and I'm packing up. It doesn't matter what's going on. I'm out. Um, yeah. And well, I so think that, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say like, that is the programming that we're trying to overcome. And when we start to push up against those comfort zones of the programming that we're running, that becomes uncomfortable. You know, it can be uncomfortable to us because we feel as men, I don't know what it's like to be a woman, but it, I feel as a man, like I have certain responsibilities, you know, as a father, as a partner, as a whatever my role is and that, you know, that, that becomes there's discomfort there. And I think sticking with that and leaning into the edges of that discomfort, that's where you, the magic starts to happen. And you really start to change that mindset and start to anchor in the fact that if you're going to show up for all these people around you, you better show up for yourself first. And it's a practice, you know, it's not a perfect, it's, it's always going to be evolving. And there's always more layers I'm finding. I mean, I'm, you know, many, many years into the journey and it's like, I'm just in awe of the, the new layers that come up. It's like, oh, holy moly, I didn't know that was going to happen next, you know? So. Well, and, and I think so. So, I mean, a lot of times, what I have found along this journey, you guys, is there's probably not a right way or a wrong way. What I do is a lot of times is I just continue to do things that make me feel good. And it's weird how science ends up validating that somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So like those morning walks, I didn't know any of the science behind it. Bam, Andrew Huberman validates why. Cortisol, which is the, the stress hormone, is the highest first thing in the morning. And if you can get that lowered by physical activity outside and getting that natural light into your third eye. I know this is some hippie shit that Jeff and I probably resonate on a lot more than some of you guys. I see Alec laughing over there because we've had some hippie conversations. But when you start to really like get back to who we are as as um, as humans, um, things change. The same thing with like the forest bathing, Japanese forest bathing that I do. And no, like I've had people go, so bro, you go get naked in the forest? No, this is like stuff that the Japanese have been doing for years. And it's really about the vibration and the energy in the trees and everything that's connected. And when you start really figuring out this stuff, it's like, oh, well, no wonder I feel great laying out here. Yeah. Yes, frequency is that exactly. Uh, it's, all the it's all the grounding, the research around grounding and, and all of that. I mean, we are electromagnetic beings. After all, we are just a technology that's being, you know, vibrated into existence, you know, through electrical impulses. Our, our thoughts are electrical impulses and, all, and et cetera. And there's, there's so much science that validates all of this stuff now. You know, somebody who's really on the cutting edge of, of measuring it and pushing the boundaries of it is Joe Dispenza. If you've read any of his work or seen anything uh, from yeah. him, he's amazing. And he's just, he's validating it in real time. And he, he was a chiropractor and had a very bad back injury. And he just thought himself through they said he wasn't going to walk again all these things and he just you know focused his energy on getting well and he became well and it's like okay well if I can heal myself I'm going to teach other people and dive into this and that's what he's been doing for the last I don't know how many years a couple decades or something but yeah, yeah that's good stuff and Robert's mentioning or no uh yeah Robert mentioned in the chat about ice bath so I ice bath often I started out with uh, like hot cold therapy in Dana Point when I was living in California and I would go in the ocean every morning and then meditate for about 20 minutes and that cold Pacific water on me every day like that's a whole other level even because it's like it's the ocean it's salt water there's rocks all around you know I'm like dodging stingrays and things like that it's like you get back to nature and things start to change so all of that is is a whole nother conversation I think like we could sit here and dive into all of that. And a lot of it, I don't even have, you know, I'm not even able to articulate, even though I've heard it over and over again, because it, it's just such a huge subject in itself. Another thing that we talked about, um, Spencer, is like when 
we start to find these changes in our lives and start to realize these changes in our lives. Like it goes back to other people's comfort zone. First, we start to get out of our comfort zone. That makes the people around us uncomfortable. So what does that look like in real time with family, friends, other people in your network? Like how have you seen the people around you change in response to the change that you've made in yourself? Because when you're increasing your income, you you have a new network of people, like people, they, they don't know where they fit in the dynamic of the relationship, you know? So how does that work out for you? Yeah, so for, uh, so when when I started to, to truly just buy in because I'd never seen anybody really, you know, I've heard this stuff about mindset. I've heard these things about being every, anything you want to be, all this other like quote unquote crap, right? Because like, I'd never seen it actually work. Um, I'd never seen anybody successful ever in my life. So I start to like, you know, I'm at the 10K mark, which growing up as a, a person making six figures, like you were like, oh my God, like so much money. Now, obviously back in the eighties and the nineties, that was a lot more money than it is nowadays, but I hit that mark and I was stuck. And then, um, you know, I had this conversation with Patrick. I know a lot of you guys have heard about this uh, with Lead Snap, the Trojan Horse method and the audit strategy that has grown my agency. Um, and like I told Jeff, those are just tools that yes, trust me, like all of us could perform those tools and we could we could use those those um, those tools in a positive manner. But really, if you don't have the mindset to keep pushing through those challenges, those tools are just tools at the end of the day um, that you have in your tool belt that you're not able to use. So um, I started to gain momentum. I was bought in. I'm starting to see this change, this positivity. Um, you know, I labeled myself as silly as it sounds, Spencer 2.0. And Jen's like, I never want to see 1.0. Um, you know, we're getting married here in August. And she's like, if we, if you were 1.0, we still wouldn't be together. Like this literally, you guys have saved my relationship. It has made me happier as a person. It has made me a better father. There's so many different things I can sit here and go, that's it. That's the reason. I can literally almost point to these things that I decided to change in my life. As I started to make these changes, um, I started to realize the the negative like leech the leeches that were just like it was it's like sludge you guys like this just vibration energy of people that like I don't know if you know if, if you guys can resonate to this but if you're you know in tune a person can just walk into a room and you're like oh shit like get me out of here that person's energy like we were out shopping um uh at Home Depot this weekend. And this lady like came up to us. We weren't even looking at her. She came up to look at paint right next to us. And both Jen and I just walked away from her because we were like, holy crap, that lady's energy is horrible. Um, and sure enough, dude, she was like this pompous lady that was bossing the Home Depot person around and just like talking to him like she was, like, you know, like he was dirt on her shoe. So I had to start setting boundaries in my own personal relationship, even with family. I'm not telling you guys to go do this because this is probably one of the, some of the most difficult stuff that I had to do. But one of the last conversations uh, that I had with my mom, um, I hadn't spoken. Uh, one of the last conversations I had with my mom before she took her life here, which was last September, um, was me laying down boundaries. So she called me up. She was spewing her, her, her crap to me, telling me that there's more to life than money like family, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, look, I have a sick partner at home. I'm taking care of my family like you told me to. Um, and like, until you can get your mental health straight, like I can't deal with this. And I had to put this boundary up with her. Um, fast forward, I really didn't talk with her ever again after this. And then, like I said, she took her life. Um, and uh, then fast forward, the 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 father I, I always like to refer to him as my my sperm donor because he's never really been like part of my life he pops in and out he was passing through uh vancouver washington where I, where i live here um this past summer actually uh to go to my mom's <laughs> as weird as it sounds man life is a trip he was going to my mom's like uh uh like end of life celebration this woman that he like abused his like the whole time they were married and he was passing through uh, and he's the type of guy that's like wants, he never like 
I've never been a priority. He's just like always kind of an afterthought. He said he was coming through and I had to put up boundaries with him. And I was like, look, you can't just like show up. You can't do, you know, like I need more of a heads up. Uh, you can't just pop in. Like I have a busy life. I'm not dropping everything for you. He proceeded to take that as I was pissed off at him. So when you, when you're dealing with people that aren't connected emotionally uh, and, and uh, on that same vibration, Jeff and I have talked about this yesterday, where if you set those boundaries up, they don't know how to really emotionally like process things. And they, if they're going to go to probably their, their, their major um, um, emotion, quote unquote emotion, which is anger for most men, uh, even though that's not a primary emotion uh, and, and just say, Oh, Spence is pissed at me. And I'm like, no, I'm not pissed. I'm just setting boundaries that I, I'm not in. I am no longer accepting shitty people in my life. Uh, so Jeff and I talked about it, you know, like, as I've mentioned on this call, uh, we're getting married in August and like, <laughs> what, what bro? We're not getting married. You and Jen. Oh, no. Yeah. Jeff and I are getting married. Oh, sorry. I, I like Jen and I are getting married. And yeah, we're not. Congratulations to both of you guys. So Jen and I are getting married and I was talking to Jeff. I was like, you know, I only want the best people in my life. That's it. Like, I will not accept anything anymore. I won't. Like, I only want like for for a guy that doesn't eat meat or animal products, like I only want caviar and filet mignon in my life anymore. That's all. And when you start to like get to this level of vibration and mindset and all these pieces, guess what happens, you guys? The universe keeps bringing these people. Magnetizing. Yes, you become a magnet, right? So Jeff and I are, we're, we're friends outside of the lead snap group and outside of, you know, this type of interaction. Uh, Patrick, same thing. You heard me mention our friend Monik, uh, and then you know my my friend uh, Mark that actually lives down in Miami. When we all got together for the mastermind, I introduced my my buddy Mark that's within my sphere to Jeff and Monik and Patrick. And these dudes are like at soccer games without me, sitting in pictures, yeah. like all hanging out. And I'm like, went on a boat around Miami Bay and all that with Mark, and and yeah, his girlfriend didn't make it, but uh, the other guy. Yeah. And so like all these amazing humans now that like are like all hanging out, that's part of my sphere. Uh, and it's, it's a bummer that they're like 3000 miles away from me right now, but eventually like I'll be down there, you know, maybe every quarter, even outside the mastermind, hanging out with amazing humans, you guys. And I, I say this because not to be like, not to, not to sound like an asshole, like, you know, like you can't have like people that aren't like high level people in your life. But those are the people that I just love to like get on the phone with. I send Jeff messages. I send Patrick messages. We exchange messages. Hey, bro, just checking in on you. Hey, you know, we're sharing things about our our uh, our partners and like how we're growing as humans and like all these amazing things because we're at that vibration and we're also pushing forward. So uh, I heard an analogy that I shared with Jeff. Um, on a podcast recently, and and if you're if you're not about evolution in this life, it's like living in a hundred room mansion, but only staying in one room. Like think about that, you guys. Like we are as humans designed to evolve. Like I told Jeff yesterday, like I feel like I've lived like four or five different lives. There was like this life when I was a child. There's this life when I was like married to my ex-wife, which I try to block out a lot of because uh, it wasn't great. You know, there's this life of like before I started to make my, my mindset transition. And then there's this. And the great thing about this mindset transition is as I started to switch the mindset piece, the money started to come. Like it's it's weird how that works, right? It's like I'm less focused on like and, and I think it's a fine line, Jeff, because when you're living in trauma and fight or flight and you're like just trying to make a buck and we've heard Robert like he's he's had like two sales, right? He's grinding, he's grinding and we've all been there and you just keep grinding and you're starting to get some momentum and momentum and momentum. You just have to continue to do those mindset things in the background, knowing like you're bought in, knowing that it's going to actually change your life. 
And then what the crazy thing is, is when you start to submit that energy, those, those prospects start to feel that the people start to trust you more. The vibration is there. It's a mindset of confidence, I think, at the end of the day. And when you start to resonate that, like you're saying, other people feel that and they trust you more because they 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 can't sense the the scarcity in your voice and in what the words that you're saying, right? So I kind of lean a lot over the, uh, have leaned a lot over the last few years on the older texts like ne uh, Neville Goddard and Napoleon Hill and William Walker Atkinson and different people like that. And they're all about see it. You can't like wait until it's there and then feel it. Like you gotta, it's the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the way Neville Goddard says. It's like, can you feel that vibration and that resonance of what your life will be like when that thing that you want is manifested in your reality? Can you feel that before it even exists? Because you're like an antenna, right? It's like the, the GMB heat map or whatever. It's like, you're the antenna, right? And so if yeah. you can resonate that frequency, the, if you look into all this, like everybody's so gung-ho on tes Tesla, right? But nobody really knows that much about the technologies that he was talking about, the 369 and all of that. And he said that if you want to know the secrets of the universe, look at energy, frequency, and vibration. You start to resonate that frequency and you just magnetize all those things into your life. So if you're feeling the feelings of what that is when the wish is fulfilled, the universe has no choice but to deliver it. And it may not be in the time or in the way that you would like it, <laughs> you know, the time frame or in the, the way exactly that you would like it. But if you continue to trust your intuition and take the actions to move yourself forward and evolve, like Spencer's saying, that's how you get to where you want to be. And at the end of the day, when you start to feel those things, or at least for me, when I start to learn to feel those things before they're in the manifest reality, then it doesn't even matter. It's like, I'm here already. I already have those things. I already am that abundant. I already have that partner. I already have these things in my life. And so whatever happens out there is just, it doesn't even matter anymore. And then when it doesn't matter, there's no scarcity. There's no fear. You're moving from a place of power and grounded focus towards those things. And then those things become much easier to actually go out and, and, and find it in your reality. So. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, so the manifestation piece of this, I think is huge. A lot of us have heard these, uh, heard people talk about vision boards and I know it's kind of sounds silly, but when I first started this journey, I put together this vision board um, and uh, it's hung up on my wall, but I don't know if we can see this here because of the blurring, but blurry, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's cars on there. There's, there's Buddha, there's a Tesla, there's a whole bunch of stuff, right? And I encourage you guys to all do that and put it someplace that you can see it, like in front of your desk so that you see this stuff all the time. Yeah, you put it on your desktop too, like whatever. Yeah, yeah on your computer, right? So I, um, I, I started seeing this gal that I would like, I don't really know what she does. I always say that she's an, an emotional intelligence coach. She's teaching me about my emotions because I never grew up knowing what emotions were, um, mostly just anger right? Because that's what a lot of us men learn is anger. <laughs> like not really the primary emotion. It's just like this. I'm just pissed. Well, why are you pissed? Let's figure this out. So anyway, I, I remember I, this was a little over a year ago and yeah, Alec, there is a Tesla on there. So a little over a year ago, I go see her and I notice she has a Tesla parked in the parking lot. And I was like, Hey, is that your Tesla? And she goes, yeah, my husband has an S as well. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. I want one of those. So into the, at the end of the appointment, she's like, hey, have you ever sat in one before? And I was like, no. So she goes, oh, come on out, right? Because she she knows, like she knows the power of this, this stuff. So I go and I sit in the car and she goes, well, I, I take since you've never sat in one, you've never rode in one. She goes, let's go for a drive. So we go for a drive. And then she's like, do you want to drive it? And I'm like, yeah. So then we get back to her office and she's like, let me take a picture of you. And she goes, now go home print off that picture of you um, in it and put it next to your uh, next to your computer. So I put it next to my computer. And, and some of this sounds like bullshit, you guys, like truly like uh, fast forward. It was less than 12 months later. I bought mine. 
nice. now I'm not, I'm not saying that the physical, like that doesn't make me happy. Granted, like it is fucking badass every day I get in and I drive it and I'm like, what? I can't believe this happens. Now there's science that proves that the dopamine hits that you get prior to the achievements actually greater than the achievement. But I can tell you those dopamine hits that I get every day when I get in that thing. Press on the gas. Bro, it gets me like, it is one of the, like, it is consistently the coolest thing ever uh, on a daily day, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Um, And that's all due, number one, to the mindset. Like, I can't sit here and say, oh, it was the Trojan horse method. It was the group strategy. Oh, it was the lead snap group. It was- Look at at that just in real time, in a real life example, Spencer. I mean, it's like several people have made great strides in their agencies by using that method, but we told that method to everybody, you know? So how many people have- believed in themselves enough or believe in these other things enough to take the action, you know, and just taking the action, like you're saying, is you have to have the belief behind it. So that's, you know, just the proof is right there. It's like how many people have actually taken it and, and become successful with it. Another example, I, Janari knows or knew Ryan Osterkamp and I became pretty good friends with him over the last few years. Unfortunately, he passed away last year, but and his, I stayed at his, his condo in San Diego a few times and he would show me like he had a million a check written out to himself for a million dollars. He had it pasted on his ceiling above his bed. So that was the first thing he saw every morning and the last thing he saw before he went to sleep. And by the time I think he was like 27, he had he had uh, cleared seven figures. So he was an amazing guy and just consistently out there banging on it. And he he and I had a lot of conversations similar to, to Spencer and I. He believed in all of the stuff that we're talking about right now and lived his life that way. So, um, yeah, love Ryan. Well, and the, and the, uh, the other thing about this too, Jeff, is like as, as these, uh, you know, things start to actually come to fruition in, in your life, like there always becomes other mindset issues, I guess, if that makes sense. When we were down in... Um, uh, San Diego for for TNC last year, Jeff and Patrick and I were having a conversation about now that I'm actually starting to make some serious money, how do I feel about that? How do I feel about the actual money? Because a lot of times it's it's super uncomfortable, right? It's so uncomfortable to you guys to me when you start making 30 to 40K a month and you start hitting like some serious big numbers that like Jen has to like, kind of bring me back to reality. And she, she was like, you realize you're like within the top 3% of income earners and almost 1%. I'm like, what? No, like, I'm not I, like, obviously the dollar is what I'm chasing, but it's not about the money. You guys, I know you keep hearing me say things about the money. It's about what it's going to buy for me, which is the freedom, which yeah. is allowing us to travel to go to San Diego, to go to Cancun, you know, to Mexico, to go to Florida for the mastermind, like all these pieces obviously takes money. And as I start to buy my time back, like then I can start to go like literally like Dan Martell talks about making a list of what you want to do in your day when you don't have to do your work, your your day-to-day work routine. For me, literally it's like morning walks, yoga, the gym, cold plunge, sauna, like, like just all self-care. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like, literally, I just want my day to be like, so what'd you do today? Well, I did some cold plunging and some hot tubbing and I hung out with my kids and I like, that is what the money is going to buy me. Well, that's where that creative, like white space that Troy was talking about yesterday. It's like, you create the opportunity to just pull back and take that walk in nature on the beach or in the forest or whatever. And you start to see things that you you couldn't see before because we only have a certain amount of bandwidth that we're able to focus our, our attention on. And like, even when you're, you know, I'm in this room right now, I'm in my, my living room, all this stuff fades away when I'm focused on the screen, right? It's like my attention isn't focused on these things. So if I pull out of it and I start, oh, wow, that's a cool piece of art over there. Remember that book? Like, what was the idea that I got or the lesson that I got out of that? It's the same thing when you're walking around in, in nature and you're outside of that sort of, you know, um, bubble where you're 
in a hurry and you're trying to deliver and you're considering what, you know, emails coming in and you're being pulled apart in so many different directions by so many different things. And then you're not centered and you're not grounded. So you're not able to think as creatively, as quickly, as inspirationally to find the solutions that you need. And so creating that white space for yourself gives you that opportunity. And the more that you create it, like, like you see Bonnick, the way he operates, like he doesn't stress about some car appointment. He's like, hey, you go do it. Like, you know, we want to get to that level. It's that hit point where, where do we have the resources so that we can create that environment around us. We've talked about Dan Martell. He has a CEO of his house. He's not booking his own travel. He's not going to the grocery store. He's not doing any of the mundane crap that takes our time and energy away from the things that we actually want to create. Like who cares about going to the grocery store or cleaning the house or whatever? We don't care about those things. Those are, you know, have to do's when you don't have somebody in that in that role for you, you know? Yeah, and you'll eventually get there, right? You know, if, you're, if your company's doing 7 million, then a lot of that stuff is taken away. Uh, right. you know, so, you know, for, for me, like overall, it's, it's just, uh, like some of this has happened extremely quick, but I know that the fact remains that if I wasn't, I mean, cause, cause let's just be real. My circumstances forced me to have to make changes. Yeah, me too. Me Jen, too. Get, Jen getting sick. I, I would be 1.0 Spencer. Um, I would be not in a relationship with an amazing woman. I wouldn't be getting married. I would probably, you know what I mean? Like I would be going backwards. I'd be stuck at 10K months, which to some of the, to some of you, like 10K months, wow, that seems like a lot of money. Yeah. It, it's it's decent, but that is not going to allow me to, to have that lifestyle that I, that I want. And, you know, for those that have read um, Ed Milet's book, The One, it's crazy to think that I am the one. Right. So like he talks about all these people that come from financial uh, well-being backgrounds, you know, like let's just say like the Ford family or the Kraft family. Like there is always somebody that had to break the financial, uh, you know, uh, uh, barrier. barrier, the history. Right. Of like being poor. Right. And so like I come from this poor background. Nobody's ever made the type of money like I don't know anybody in my family has ever made money like me. My dad, like. He, he has a, has no clue, right? Like I'm able to like drop money on things now where like prior to like spend a hundred bucks was like, oh shit, I got to think about this. Now it's like a thousand and up. I'm like, eh. Now he's buying like hundred dollar sandals. Yeah. hundred dollar <laughs> sandals, bro. Like, like, like all these things. Oh. Like it's, it's not about that. Like, and, and now I'm like, I'm to turn into this guy where it's like, I don't want to stay in a hotel that's not a five-star place, like, unless it's just me. And I'm like, I just need a bed to crash on with the roaches, you know, like, uh, so like your lifestyle changes. I think that that also helps because if you know about the reticular activating system, the RAS, you are basically what you continually think about. Right. Yeah. So like, like my kids, I tried to explain it to them. They're like, dad, like ever since you got the Tesla, I see Teslas all over the place. And I was trying to explain that to them, right? Like this is what you think of all the time, you guys. So like, instead of me asking my kids, hey, hey how was your school day? I now ask them like, hey, did you see any acts of kindness? Right? What is that forcing them to do? They know dad's going to be asking about kindness. So now they're looking for yeah. kindness. That's amazing. Right. So like when you start looking for those things, it's 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 proven. Right. So like let's, let's focus on those things you want in your life, those beach trips, those things. And guess what? Your mind will create how you can get there. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, that's great, Spencer. Going back real quick, like you said, you were forced into the change and, and I was, too. So when people look at my life and my routines and different things like that, oh, you're so disciplined or or what it's like, no, I, I didn't choose to like start doing yoga. Like I didn't have any choice. Like it was like either that or I'm going to die. Like it was, it was bad. Like it was really bad. So I think that I hope that some people on this call or some people who see this call and are focusing on mindset can figure out a way to create that pain and pleasure dynamic to where they can make some of these shifts without having to go down into the ditch. Like maybe Spencer and I did to get there or have it 
the universe like you know put its boots on my neck and was like you know <laughs> man you now, those are some... now or else right yeah right so the other thing too that i've also noticed jeff with this is as i had became who i am we'll just say 2.0 it's amazing how uh trauma recognizes trauma subconsciously yeah. totally like, I can sit here and probably look around the room and, 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 and like, I can tell by vibration and by how people act that, that there's some people in here that I know without even bringing up things that have some shit, even without them sharing. Well, and that, there's no shame in that. It's like, I think that the way I have started to view not only like entrepreneurship, but like relating in general and, you know, with people and things like that, it's like, it's a spiritual path because it's uncovering the traumas that we need to face and going back to this evolution that we're here for it's like i kind of feel like i've been given a gift of life like let me see how much i can evolve in this one single lifetime so i'm going to go out there and i'm going to create experiences that are going to uncover that darkness going to uncover those traumas and give me the tools to transmute those and to move through those and to continue to learn and grow and to communicate and resonate with the people around me to bring those people up as well. And that's why Spencer and I are in this conversation right now, because Spencer and I start connecting at that level and we're like, okay, boom, well, let's, let's raise each other up, you know? So, well, and it's, and it's weird. I mean, I'm talking about trauma recognizes trauma. Jeff starts to share just a little bit and we go, holy shit, dude. Like you we do very similar things to get like just right. separate as people, but like similar things where it's almost like, kind of eerie it's eerie like that you know like our relationship things that him and i've been been through with our exes are very similar and then we're starting to be able to like be a bright light with other people that are having these the or are going through problems or experiences where we're able to like maybe share and help that person get through their their um challenges yeah. Because we're just a, we're just like maybe a couple of steps in a, in another direction. Not it's not even ahead or behind or whatever. It's like we just went on a path that you know somebody else may not have gone down. What we're talking about is like you know food for thought, food for conversation, the ad infinitum. I want to share a couple of books that I have really tuned into. The first one is the the power of the subconscious mind by Joseph Murphy. It was written in 1963. So I kind of tune into a lot of these kinds of books. They're not very big. What you can do is go into chat GPT and say, summarize the book, The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy, and it'll give you the rundown. And then if you're interested enough, you can uh, actually find YouTube videos where these things are narrated. You don't even have to buy them. And they're so short and they're not, they're in the public domain now. Here's another one called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. That's from 1913. So same thing. These are super small books, but both of them tune into the subconscious mind and the power of what you're telling yourself. Ultimately, like we've been talking about on this call is like going just it's that belief. It's like I gave the example one time on a call uh, on a lead snap call where I first had to start to be able to say these things to myself. And then I had to be able to start to believe them. And then I just became them, you know, and that was a multiple year process. It wasn't something that I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. It was like, it happened. But like literally in the beginning, I would do yoga and then go run on the beach. And I had these affirmations and I would go run along the water. Nobody could hear me. So I'm like yelling these affirmations over and over as I'm running down the beach. That's the first step is just to get my my body to release and to be able to accept even these like short affirmation statements. Like when you're before I started the process of really accepting that and, and accepting myself and, and starting to grow in that way, like I, I couldn't even get the words out. Right. So I had to force those words out over and over and over again. And it's like, Oh, now I'm comfortable with that. And now I, now I start to believe this a little bit. And then it's like, all of a sudden I look around I'm like, wow, I am that, you know, so well, I, and I think it's just also just taking, just doing something right. Like, like, yeah. like making this decision to just move forward and say, you know what, like I can be a victim. I can sit in this, in this position and I can sit here and not believe it and think like mindset's bullshit, but you know what, like, like if what happens is if you push forward and, and like mindset is bullshit, you're going to be at the same place that you were in when you begin. But what if not? right? What if not? What if it's this amazing thing that you've discovered and, and, 
And sure enough, like Jeff and I have discovered that mindset is like the game changer in like anything that we do. Like it helps me with, with everything. What would you say, Spencer, if you could offer three action steps? Like I offer a couple books, take it or leave it. But if you like in your own experience, like here's three things you can do today to get this shit under control. Yeah. So, um, so I would say some sort of morning exercise first thing, right? Get a, get a sweat. Even if it's just walking, you guys, like I'm, so I was a college track athlete. I hate, I hate running these days. So for me, it's walking, right. And, uh, doing something first thing in the morning for yourself is a game changer. There's just so much science behind it. Like it is very difficult, you guys, to be stressed, anxious, all these emotions that we don't like when you are moving forward, right? So think about that. When you are moving forward, a lot of the stress and anxiety and, and depression, it all goes away. Um, so I would say moving your body. I would say figuring out a way to disconnect. We all own agencies. We all own, we're all in front of these computers and our, and our cell phones and technology. We need to be in a, we need to get to a spot where we go back to our ancestry, whatever that looks like for you. Like, like truly, if you would have told me four years ago that I would be laying in a hammock in the woods once a week to like, for like five, four, you know, five, six hours, <laughs> I would probably tell you you're nuts, but that is the way I recharge. And, it, and, and and whatever recharges for you, I would try to get back to where you you have a period of time where you set some boundaries for yourself. Like after after five o'clock or after six o'clock, I'm not I'm not touching technology. I'm going to hang out with my family. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm not messing with this stuff because it can be a, a, a total suck on your life. Um, and then I would also say just just try to dive into books um, in general. Um, you know, like can't hurt me by David Goggins that like it, it truly has changed my life. The one by Ed Milet has changed my life. Um, and, uh, also just, just reading books and listening to them audio at the same time, because it does help it really sink in. Um, and, and also, Hey man, who, who, who doesn't want to, the author of the book a lot of times to read the freaking book to you. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it also, what you said earlier was like, what's right for you? Like there's a, there's a whole menu of things that you can do, but just choose off the menu and start taking action. That, that's what I did. The, my mentor handed me the yoga menu and I started doing the yoga menu, you know, and that worked for me. And it led to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the next thing I knew I'm doing myofascial release and I'm, you know, ice bathing and whatever. It just kind of all leads to where it is, but choose the thing that, is going to resonate with you and speak to you and, and draw you in so that it's not something that you're like, Oh my God, I have to do that again. You know, do something that's going to, you're drawn to, that's going to call it out of you. Cause there's a million paths. I think they all lead to the same direction. If you have the right intention in mind. And I think that's what we're trying to relate to you here is that if you're, you want to become better, you want to evolve, you want to transmute trauma and all of these things there's a million modalities. It's like, and also uh, to add a fourth thing, surround yourself with people that have similar history background, uh, people that want the similar things, right? So Jeff and I've had several conversations because we're buddies. Him and I are on the same projection. Um, there was a, you guys can Google this. There was a, an old Snoop Dogg YouTube video that I saw, which when I first became a business owner, I didn't really understand why my friendships were like turn into crap, right? And he talks about closing the gap. If you guys Google closing the gap, Snoop Dogg, he, he's talking to some young rapper. I don't know who he is. And he talks about as he grows as a person, that 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 friend is going to have to grow as well. And if they don't, they're going to get left behind. And when I realized that, I was like, oh, this makes sense why like my friends from high school I'm not friends with anymore because they didn't have that mindset to grow. Now I have like a, a friend like Jeff and Patrick and you know these guys that are like like have this strong mindset and like are you know uh, uh, surrounding themselves in masterminds and all these things because they want to grow. 
Now, as I grow, Jeff's growing, as I grow, Jeff's growing or vice versa or whatever the case is, but we're growing together and he's not living in the hundred room mansion and staying in one room because I can't, I can't relate to that anymore. That was 1.0, maybe, maybe that was like not even a 1.0. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's no coincidence that it's no coincidence that the people that I, that inspire me, the Dan Martells of the world and uh, Troy Hoffman, who was talking to yesterday and, you know, people like that that are playing at a super high level. Uh, Rob Deerdeck is another guy that I tune in with them. I mean, those guys are so regimented and focused on what they want to create. And it's a practice for me to pull that energy in and, and have that single point of focus like Napoleon Hill talks about. But we're all where we are in our journey. I still have, you know, mountains of shit to uncover and transmute and, and all of that. And you know, some people are way ahead in some areas and I'm still a baby and I'm way ahead. And so like, it's, it's all relative, but like Spencer's saying, you start to get these people around you and you become the average of the, the five people you spend the most time with. It's like, then you, you really start to pay more attention on where you're spending your time, what you're doing and what kind of uh, things are distracting you and taking your energy away. So this has been an awesome conversation. It looks like from the chat, it's well-received. I think that we could probably talk about, we kind of threw it all into the mix. It's a big gumbo right here, but any one of these uh, topics or concepts could be an hour-long conversation on their own. So I appreciate you guys paying attention and coming on here and participating in the chat. It looks like a lot of people are interested in this kind of stuff. So I look Jeff, forward do you want to, do you want to uh, open it up, like let people go and just open it up for questions if people want to stick yeah, around? Do that. Yeah, sure. Let's uh, yeah, let's, let's give, let's give a few minutes for, for questions. If anybody has one, go ahead and open the floor. Alec, were you raising your hand or are you just happy hands, jazz hands? <laughs> no, I think, I think I'm going to have to jump out and run, but I appreciated it. I appreciate the chat today and the always growing mindset and yeah, bro. Just like people trying to people knowing that it can be better on the other side and you don't have to like necessarily uh, you don't ruin yourself by making yourself better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And stress does not end up and it does not allow you to end up in a good place for sure. So the, the, the other thing that I didn't touch on too is, is, is as you continue to start doing this mindset, all of us have that voice in your head. I always call it the bitch voice, pardon my French, but it's that one that's constantly always like, it's always been super loud um, from my background. You know, that one that's that negative voice that we all have. You know, I kind of always think of the devil and the angel on your shoulder. And uh, the, the that voice, that negative voice, the volume actually decreases. It doesn't go away. The most successful people always even tell you they still have that voice, but it does, the volume level decreases. To where that positive Spencer and that positive voice that keeps telling you push through it, you can do this, like, look at what you've done. And I start to celebrate those small wins, which I think a lot of us forget to do. That becomes a lot louder than that negative voice. Right on. Uh, what do you got, Robert Strata, the third? And sorry, you did. All right. So I wanted to ask, what do you think is one of the pivotal moments, like when you're really in the suck and you're like, man, like, I got to be 2.0 Spencer or like, or like I'm done for, I'm done for like, what was the exact moment you shared this trauma, you shared the mother, yeah, the wife, like what was I, like was, the thing that was like, it was, June, it. it was June of 2020, dude. I, I, I remember I was sitting in on a curb at my uh, daughter's school, having that conversation with a therapist. And uh, that, that was it. Like, he was like, you need to do something, dude, or else like, or I mean, not that I was going to take my own life, but I was in a very bad place of like, just tr like, I like truly like the only way I can explain is like, I felt like I was drowning. I didn't have enough air. And I was just so anxious and so stressed because I had all this pressure and I had a sick partner. And there's a lot of uncharted territory that I didn't know how to handle. I thrive in chaos because that's what I've known my whole life. But the more that you get out of the chaos, the more that that, the, I guess, the more that becomes uncomfortable. And I'm slowly getting to a, to a place where not being in chaos is feeling more and more, quote unquote, the norm. Um, so that was kind of like the pivotal moment. Um, and I just took a leap of faith. Like I literally like 
like I would encourage you all to just take a jump without a parachute. There's no parachute. Just just jump off the cliff. Leap before looking. Yeah. Just jump. Yeah. For for me, it was kind of equally as um, traumatic. You know, I had lost my job and basically effectively ended my career. I uh, went broke. I was dealing with trying to raise two children with a with uh, my ex. There was addiction involved. It was it was a mess complete mess and I literally dropped to my knees and raised my hands to this guy and said universe like I got nothing left and the universe showed up and lifted me up and it was literally like that <laughs> that was my moment what do you got Johnny yeah good stuff guys uh just had a question um and not sure if it relates to you guys. So being the entrepreneur mindset, how do you bring your significant other along if they're not that entrepreneur mindset? Like my wife is a, she has a W-2 job. She, you know, likes doing that. She doesn't really have that entrepreneur mindset that I have. So as I'm growing and I have more time and you know, more money coming in, as, as much as I want to work is how much I'm going to make. It's not the same on that side. So how do you stay, I don't know, on the same level? Uh, like, how can I bring her along? But I don't know. I'm kind of in a in a weird space right now. Just wanted to see if you guys ever went through that. I know I did. Uh, I think that was a lot of what caused the, the uh, fractionalization of my relationship with my ex. We were married for 10 years. And in the beginning, she was super... Um, you know, going after goals and things like that and got to a certain level and then just kind of stopped. And we came together, we were both resonating at this sort of scarcity mindset frequency. And then over time, I started going like this and she kind of plateaued. And it just, I didn't have any skills, relating skills, communication skills, emotional intelligence, I and mean, very little of that and, and very little awareness of what was going on. So that was that was the reason why we, we couldn't work through it. You having a, an awareness of it, I think, is already a huge advantage. And it's not like your partner has to be exactly like you, but it's like you want to make sure that, in my opinion, you, you want to make sure that you not only are able to communicate well, but that you each know your place and role in the relationship at any given time. So that if your partner is like, I'm cool with this job and this is what I foresee over the next two, three, five, 10 years in, in this role. And you're like, well, I'm going to make, you know, 10 figures a year. So how is that going to affect you? Are you going to quit that job or then what are you going to do with your time? What are you going to do with your energy? What's going to be interesting for you to, to learn and, and grow as continue to learn and grow as a human. So I think that, you know, getting on that same page and understanding the trajectory of where you want to get to without like necessarily being outcome, you know, expectation oriented or anything, but just talking it out and being like, well, what if this were the truth? You know, what if we did have eight figures a year coming in and you didn't have to do anything and we could travel wherever we wanted, we could get whatever car we wanted, we could make whatever impact on the people around us we wanted. Like, how would that change your, what you want to do with your life or, or not? And just understanding that ahead of time, I think, so you can see it before it happens, you know, or at least have, have the communication ability and, you know, capability to talk it out, I think is very important. Um, I, I didn't realize how important communication was <laughs> until, until I did, you know, it's like, so, you know, that would be my, what do you think, Spencer? That looks like uh, it's a lot of people are in the same boat. So what I would encourage all you guys to do with your partners is sit down and just have a conversation and, and even draw out what, what kind of that ideal life looks like for them, right? So like my ideal life might be different than Jen's ideal life, which I know is not the case because we're pretty clear on this, right? And then reverse engineer this. You know, we as, we as entrepreneurs, we're a lot more strategic. We're business owners. We're, we're planning, right? So let's plan this out. Let's figure out, you know, if it's the traveling piece, is it the living on a piece of property out in the middle of nowhere? What does this ideal lifestyle look like? And then reverse engineer it. The other piece that was a huge game changer, it was like actually quite offensive in the beginning, but uh, to, to Jen, but this was recommended by our therapist was 
we actually literally schedule on my calendar time for each other. Yeah. Um, so I know there's a lot of times you guys, uh, so Jen, Jen comes from the corporate world, um, uh, corporate sales world. So she doesn't understand the, the, um, the piece of being an entrepreneur and the pressure of it, but she's my biggest cheerleader because she knows that um, it takes money to do these things that she, this lifestyle that she wants to live. She knows that if anybody's able to, to get to where um, we want to be as a couple, I can do that. So, you know, Johnny, I would sit down with your wife and say, okay, babe, like, what is it that you want life lifestyle wise? Do you want to work uh, your corporate job, you know, punching a clock every day or, or would you much rather just be a stay at home, uh, you know, wife? Um, and then um, like what Jen and I did was like every Friday night is our date night. So we go on a date every Friday night. We did it pre pandemic. Um, we go grab coffee every morning um, as, ex as expensive as that is. We get to spend a half hour, 45 minutes together, be like beginning part of my day, whatever that looks like for you. Um, I think as a partner, if you can have that partner feel like they're um, they're part of the, the of the of the journey, as well as they understand the mindset. My ex-wife was one of these people that was like, you work too much. This was when I owned my insurance agency. Like you're working all the time. I never get to see you, blah, blah, blah. And then on the other hand was like, we, we can't pay this bill because of blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, you can't, you can't tell me I'm working too much and then be complaining that we can't pay the bills because it's not like that. Like you have the, that partner has to buy in that if you don't work, you don't make the money, if that makes sense, especially at this, at this stage of where, you know, a lot of the agency owners on this call are at where. You don't have people like a team that are running your company to where you can just kick back and, and do whatever you want without you actually putting forth effort and quote unquote working on a daily basis. So uh, hopefully scheduling uh, your partner on your calendar, as weird as that is, it, like it, it was offended. Jen's like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Like, you got to put me on your calendar. And I'm like, well, yeah, like that's the way I operate as a business owner. Like if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't get done. And yeah. she's like, what? But now she's like game changer, like right? Because she's getting the time with you that she needs. Right? Yeah, and that's like that's one of her main love languages after becoming sick is time. And I would I would encourage you to, to discover what your you know there's if you haven't read the book the five love languages figuring out what your partner's love languages are so then that you that way you can speak to them. That that and also understanding who you are as an entrepreneur and I think the guy who really hits home for me is Alex Charpin. We mentioned his book, The Entrepreneurial Personality Type. He also has a podcast, Alex Charpin. If you look him up, and the book is not very big, but I think that if you read that or listen to it on Audible or just listen to his podcast in general, he has a very quick hit podcast. I think it's like five to ten minutes long. And he is dropping complete gold all the time. And I think that it really, listening to his content has allowed me to look at myself in the mirror as an entrepreneur and be like, oh yeah, like this, I'm not like everybody else. There are these certain differences in the way that I operate, the way that I think, the things that I want in my life. And for me understanding that, then when I, I'm with somebody else who's not an entrepreneur or whatever, is not in my world. It's it just it's easier for me to understand how to explain things to them, how to you know convey ideas and different things like that. So I would highly recommend that. There's another question in the chat. What have you done to make a change for your subconscious mind? I've tried headphones, which I think is uh, binaural beats, listening to something overnight. I've done a lot of that stuff too, Caesar. I've listened to things um, like the uh, meditation and frequency vibration binaural beats, all kinds of stuff like that. And I think for me, it's always, it's always phases and there's different modalities and practices that kind of wind their way in and out. And I mean, I could give you the, the menu of, of things that I <laughs> wind in and out of, but it's extensive and uh, it's, you know, a little woo woo. But I think what we talked about before is just like finding those things that make the most sense to you but you did direct the uh, question directly to what did Spencer do to change his sub subconscious mind? Spencer, what was the, what were those things? 
Yeah, so I, I have tried Hypno. Um, that unlocks the subconscious. I haven't been as as um, committed to that. My therapist does that type of uh, therapy as well. Um, truly, truly, I started microdosing mushrooms, um, and that's reprogramming uh, my subconscious, the, the, the roadmaps. Um, if you guys haven't, I mean, there's a ton of technology or sorry, science coming out about, uh, mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, I also microdose mushrooms. And, uh, what that has helped me do is become, uh, you know, I think I see Robert sitting there smiling. I, I think a lot of us are extremely reactive, um, given our history and our background. If you grow up in trauma, you're, you're like, you know, you're reactive like this. And so, that's all from the subconscious. A lot of times I don't understand why I'm even like that. I'm like, I don't like that person. Why did I just react like that? Like, what the hell's wrong with me? Um, the, the mushrooms have allowed me to uh, like actually process things through to where I'm not super reactive. Um, and I can go, you know what? Like, dude, this isn't a, like, you shouldn't get, be getting pissed about this. Um, like, like, you know what I mean? And so like, I think the subconscious usually would take over um, where um, the mushrooms have slowed things down to where I can process it through and go, this isn't something to like be be angry about. Let's just move on with life. Yeah, I, I find that some of the larger dose mushroom um, that I eat, <laughs> it definitely brings up those things, those fears, those latent kind of things in my system where it's like I can feel into something that's like, a, a memory or a thought about someone or something that may be more uh, fear-based or negative. And it's like, what the hell is that? And I bring it up and then it just, I'm able to confront it instead of it just being a pattern that's being run in, you know, in my day-to-day -day where that pattern might run and I don't even recognize it. I don't even have an awareness of it. It's in a blind spot that, it allows me to open up to that, confront it and move through it and kind of like think my way through and be like, well, why does that bother me so much? Or why am I afraid of that? Or what is that? Why does that even freaking matter? It was like third grade and like whatever, you know, it's like, why do I care about this now? Like, you know, so it, it really, really opens up, I think, the field to reprogramming. Um, Spencer, okay, got it. All right, well... If we don't have any more questions, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, check out Paul Stamets for sure. Um, they have there's a, a documentary on Netflix, or at least there was called Fantastic Fungi. Fantastic Fungi. The, Fantastic Fungi. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the cinematography in that thing is off the rails. Uh, Patrick and I and Fernando watched it one night, and it is just unbelievable. If for nothing else, and he kind of like sets he sets the stage right he brings you in about us wow our mushrooms amazing and then the second half he's like the shoe drops like here's why you should be eating psilocybin so yeah. and, and and the thing is like he is a self-proclaimed professor he's actually up here in uh in thomas and i's area i know thomas is up in olympia tacoma area um and and he is his method is what i follow you can look up the paul statements um uh, method, I think, is what they call it, which is the the, the mushrooms to be twelve, the lion's mane, uh, stuff like that for the reprogramming. Yeah, he, th that that show is amazing for the cinematography alone. And then if you if you resonate with the message, great. All right, y'all. Thanks for joining, Spencer. Thank you so much. It's always great spending time with you, getting to dive into your mindset and a little bit more about what you're you're thinking on your path because. What you've experienced so far is only scratching the surface of what you're going to experience to move forward into that, not only the 40K a month, but 400K months. We have to continue to evolve, grow, break our comfort zones, break the patterns, break the whatever is holding us back. And for all of us, it, it's, it's different, but many of those things are the same. So I appreciate you coming on here and sharing your journey and your genius with us. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for joining. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.